Hello, Algebra 1 students. In this video, I'm going to be going over how to compare and interpret function values in different scenarios, including graphs and equations. So for this first slide, we're going to use this graph of Denise's bicycle ride in order to answer the questions below. So the first question is asking, is the graph a function and how do we know? So of course, until we can't answer any questions about this graph until we know whether or not it's a function. Now, if you recall, in order for um, something to be a function, that means every input can only have one output, or in other words, every x value can only have one y value. So when I'm looking at the graph, one of the tricks we use is something called the vertical line test, which means I need to make sure that there's nowhere on this graph where if I put a vertical line through it, it's touching more than one point at once. Another way to think about it is to see if any x values are repeating. So we're basically trying to check that there aren't any two points right on top of each other sharing the same x value. So you can kind of see that no matter where I put a line through my graph, a vertical line, you can tell that these vertical lines are only ever touching one part on our uh, graph at once. Okay, and again, you don't have to draw the vertical lines. You can also just look at the graph and see if there's anywhere on the graph where there are two points exactly on top of each other sharing an x value. And I can see that there is not anywhere on the graph where um, more than one point has the same x value. So yes, the graph is a function because... And there's a lot of different ways you could explain it. I'm going to say because there are no two points sharing the same x value. And of course, you can also mention that it passes the vertical line test, but make sure you explain what that means, kind of like I did. I said, you know, passing the vertical line test means there are no two points sharing the same x value. So you can't just use passing the vertical line test as your explanation. You need to explain what that tells us about the graph and how we know it's a function. The next question asks, what is the independent variable and what is the dependent variable? Now, we talked about this in class, but since I can see my two variables on the graph are time and hours and distance and miles, first of all, we know that the independent variable is always our x value or whatever's on our horizontal axis, and our dependent variable is always our y value or whatever's on our vertical axis. Another way to remember it is whenever time is a variable, time is always the independent variable because I cannot control time. I can't stop time. I can't make it go faster or slower. Time is always moving independently of anything else going on. So time is always our independent variable. And then the other variable is going to always be what's depending on the time. So it's our dependent variable. Again, the independent is the X. So it's always whatever's on the horizontal axis. Dependent is always Y, so whatever's on the up and down vertical axis. So the independent variable is the time in hours. Independent variable is always time. The dependent variable is the distance in miles. Now the next question asks us to fill in the blanks to complete the function statement based on the graph. It says blank is a function of blank. <clears throat> to fill this in, um, I always put the dependent variable first and the independent variable second. Because remember, the dependent variable is depending on the independent variable. So another way of saying that is the dependent variable is a function of the independent variable. So I'm going to fill in my first blank with distance in miles. So it'll say distance is in miles is a function of time and hours. It's always the dependent variable first in this statement and the independent variable second. All right, number four asks find f of three. Now remember when I see f parentheses three, the way I say that out loud is just what I just said, f of three. Okay, so 
three is inside the parentheses, so three is my input, okay? So that means I need to look on my x-axis or, or where my independent variable is to find my input of three and then figure out what is the output at that spot on the graph. So I'm looking here on my horizontal axis for the number three. I don't see three, but I do see two and four, so I know three is right between two and four. Okay, so that means I'm looking at this point on the graph right here, and I need to know what is the output. Okay, so that means what is the y value at that point? And I can go to the left to my y-axis to figure that out, and I can see that this is right at zero on the y-axis. So f of three is equal to zero. The next question asks, which is greater, f of 6 or f of 10? So I'm going to have to find, again, where are these points on my graph? What are the output for each of these input values? So again, 6 is my input. So I'm going to go on my x-axis to look for 6. I see it right here. And then I'm going to go up to my graph and find the point on the graph where x is 6. Then I need to figure out my output by going to the left to look at my y-axis. And it looks like the output is 4. So now I know f of 6 is equal to 4. So I can't figure out which is greater until I figure out what both of them are equal to. So I know f of 6 is equal to 4. Now I need to find out what f of 10 is equal to. So I'm going back to my x-axis looking for the number 10, which I see right here. Going up to my graph to find that point on the graph. And then I need to follow to the left to find what's the y value here. And it's 2. So that means f of 10 is equal to 2. So now I'm saying which one is greater, f of 6 or f of 10? Well, f of 6 is equal to 4. So f of 6 is greater. So f of 6 is greater. You can also tell that by looking at the graph. The two points we looked at were f of 6 and f of 10. And you can tell f of 6, the point at 6, is higher on the graph than f of 10. So that's another way to tell that f of 6 is greater. Last question for this is fill in the blank below with one of the following symbols. Remember, this one is less than. Okay, so if it's pointing left, it's less than. Pointing right, it's greater than. And then, of course, our equal sign means equal to. So fill in the blank with one of the following symbols. I have f of 5 on the left of the blank and f of 7 on the right of the blank. So again, it's going to be helpful if I can actually go to my graph and figure out what f of 5 is equal to and f of 7 is equal to so I can figure out what which is bigger or if they're equal. So if I look for f of 5, I see 4 and 6 on my x-axis. Let me use blue. Um, here's the 5 on my x-axis, so I just need to find what's the output. So I go up to my graph, and I can see that this is at the y value of 4. So f of 5 has the value of 4, okay? And then f of 7 is in between 6 and 8. I go up to my graph. Here's another blue point. As you can see, it's at the same exact height as the other blue point. So this it means f of 7 is also equal to 4. So that means I need to put an equal sign between them because f of 5 and f of 7, 5 and 7 are our inputs, and they both have the output of 4 on this graph. All right, now let's go on to a scenario where we don't have a graph. This is going to be asking us to interpret some function values. So this is Sarah is using her oven in order to bake cookies. She turns on the oven, and it takes 10 minutes to heat up to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Then she bakes the cookies for 10 minutes at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Finally, she turns off her oven. So in this situation, it's telling us the function S gives the temperature of the oven in degrees Fahrenheit based on the time T in minutes after Sarah turns the oven on. So the first statement says, explain what S of 2 is less than S of 9 means in the context of the scenario. Well, Remember that in this case, uh, time is our input. So, you know, time is always the independent variable. Time is always going to be the input. So that means we have an input of two minutes and an input of nine minutes. Okay. And then the function S is giving us the temperature of the oven. 
So when we when it's saying S of two, it's saying if I plug in two minutes, what would be my temperature? Now I can't necessarily figure that out. I don't need to know what the output is for both of these. I just need to interpret what it means for S of two to be less than S of nine. Well, we know S of two is telling us the temperature of the oven after two minutes, right? Because two is the input or the time. And we know when we plug the input into our function, it's giving us the temperature at that time. So S of two is the temperature after two minutes and then S of nine would be the temperature after nine minutes. So what does it mean if S of two is less than S of nine? I just need to put the words less than in between what I already know, okay? It says, so S of two is the temperature after two minutes, S of nine is the temperature after nine minutes, and it's saying S of two is the smaller, smaller temperature. So that means the temperature after two minutes is less than the temperature after nine minutes. Okay, so I just use my inputs to figure out what is the input in this situation, it's time. So we're talking about the temperature after two minutes, the temperature after nine minutes, and the less than sign says the temperature after two minutes is less than the temperature after nine minutes. Now the next one has an equal sign. It says S of 10 equals S of 15. So again, 10 is one of the inputs. So this S of 10 is talking about the temperature after 10 minutes. S of 15 is talking about the temperature after 15 minutes. Well, if they're equal, that means it's just telling us that the temperature after 10 minutes is the same or equal to as the temperature after 15 minutes. All right, last one says write a function statement that represents the temperature being 200 degrees Fahrenheit five minutes after she turns the oven on. Okay, well, my input is five minutes, so that's going to be what goes in my parentheses. My output is 200 degrees, so that's going to be what goes outside the parentheses. So now I just need to write this correctly. So for in this case, I always put my function name first. My function name is S, right? Then I always put my parentheses next. My input goes in the parentheses. My input is always time, so 5 goes in the parentheses. I put my equal sign, and my output, which is temperature in this case, goes outside the parentheses. So S of 5 equals 200. S parentheses 5 equals 200. That's how we write our function statement. All right, we've got one more, and this is about evaluating functions. So we have the function, this one's called h, h of x equals 5 parentheses x minus 2 plus 1, okay? The first question is just asking us to list the mathematical operations occurring in the function in the correct order. Now remember, in order to do this, we need to use PEMDAS, and I will remind you what each of these stands for. P stands for parentheses, that's my longest one, E stands for exponents, M stands for multiply, D stands for divide, A stands for add, S stands for subtract. I'll put a little divider so you can read. All right. So we're going to use PEMDAS to figure out the correct order of operations. So if I need to start with P, always start with P. Do I see any parentheses in my function? I do see parentheses in my function. Right here, I see parentheses X minus two. So that means I need to do whatever's in the parentheses first. And what's in the parentheses is I'm subtracting two from whatever I plug in. So my first step would be to subtract two from the input or x. Okay, 
Now I go on to exponents. Do I see any exponents? I don't see any exponents here. Next, multiply. Do I see any multiplication? Well, let's see. I have multiplying. I have a 5 outside the parentheses, which means 5 is multiplying. And then I have a plus 1, which means 1 is adding. So I do have multiplication here. 5 is the next step. Multiplying by 5 is the next step because m is the next thing in PEMDAS. So multiply by 5 is the second step. And then finally, the last thing, I can keep going through PEMDAS. I can look at D, see if there's any dividing. I don't see any dividing. And then I get to A, which is adding. And I do have adding here, which is plus 1. This is my addition. So my third step is to add 1. So I can use these steps to evaluate the next two parts. So I have find H of 0. So remember, 0, 0 is my input. So I just need to follow the steps above. I need to do these steps to my input of zero, and that'll help me. So I can literally just do each step to zero. So I'm going to kind of show you two ways you can do this, like two methods of completing it on your paper, and you can pick what work, works best for you. So I'm going to start by using the step-by-step -step method. So I'm going to literally start by subtracting two from zero, then multiply by five, then add one. So if I subtract, so my first step is to subtract 2 from 0. So if I do 0 minus 2, that gives me negative 2. Now my next step is to multiply that by 5. So I take negative 2, multiply it by 5, and that gives me negative 10. And then my last step is to add 1. So I remember, always take the number that you got at the end of your last step and do the next step. So then I add 1 and it gives me negative nine as the output. Now, another way you can kind of think about it is actually just copy down the function and replace x with our new input. And our new input was zero. So I just wrote h, I completely copied the function h, but wherever I saw an x, I replaced it with zero, as you can see right here. And so I can still follow the same steps here. So First thing is do whatever's in the parentheses. So I have 0 minus 2, which gives me negative 2. Then I have to multiply. So 5 times negative 2 gives me negative 10. And then finally, I have to add negative 10 plus 1, which gives me negative 9. So it's the same thing. Now I'm going to do the last one in the, most, in the same method I just did. So if h of negative 5, that means my input is... is um, negative 5. So I'm going to copy down my function, but I'm going to replace x with negative 5. So h of, instead of h of x, I'm going to write h of negative 5 equals 5 parentheses. I see an x, so I'm going to replace it with negative 5. Now I need to do each of my steps. My first step is always to subtract 2. Remember, go back up there and look at those steps to remind you. So I subtract 2, so negative 5 minus 2 gives me negative 7. My next step is to multiply by 5. So 5 times negative 7 gives me, if you do that in a calculator, you might need it, negative 35. And then my last step is to add 1. So negative 35 plus 1, that gives me negative 34 as the output. All right? Okay, I hope this helps you complete your practice.